Hey guys, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Oder, and today we're gonna be doing a video all about the science behind burning wood in your barbecue smoker. The two questions we're gonna be answering today are, number one, what happens when you burn wood in your smoker? Number two, what should you do to get the best possible results? For our first question, what happens when you actually burn your wood in your smoker? I wrote down a few important details here that we're gonna discuss. And no, you don't have to know all of this to produce great barbecue. It's just a psychological operation. What's happening here is uh, the government's trying to make you think that you gotta know this stuff in order to make great barbecue, but you don't. But really, these are important things to understand the why, not just the what to do. And in my opinion, while it's not necessary to understand all this to make great barbecue, I think what this gives you is adaptability. What I mean by that is this. You can cook on many different cookers, but if you know all the principles involved, you can make great barbecue on any cooker. The more information you have, the better you can adapt to different situations. Say it's been raining on your wood. Well, what are you gonna do to compensate for that? Or is it a good thing? Uh, say you're cooking on somebody else's smoker because you have a big event that you're trying to feed you know, 400 people for. These things give you the tools to handle all of those situations. And that's why I think it's important to understand the why. Not because it's gonna make you a better person, not because you have to understand all this to make great barbecue, but it gives you more tools in your tool belt to be the best pit master you can possibly be. Wood is made up of three primary components. We have cellulose, we have hemicellulose, and lignin. There are also a small percentage of other compounds that are gonna be present in the wood, but for our discussion right now, we're gonna leave those until later. In hardwoods, which is what you're gonna to wanna to burn, rather than softwoods, cellulose makes up about 42% of the wood. Hemicellulose makes up 38% of the wood and lignin about 15%. Now these are all variable numbers. It's not any piece of hardwood is definitely gonna have 38% hemicellulose, but on average, that's about where it is. Now, when we're talking about hardwoods, that's important because you only want to burn hardwoods. Softwoods can have sap and other things in them that would produce absolutely horrendous barbecue. Think of, you know, trying to burn pine. Awful, horrible idea, don't do it. So we're gonna limit our discussion here only to hardwoods. The small percentage of things in wood that are not cellulose, hemicellulose, or lignin, they're important for flavor, we'll talk more about those later, but they're not super important in terms of the energy produced because with barbecue, what you're doing is using wood, not only for the heat, but also for flavor. Right now, let's talk about the heat. So a pound of hardwood has on average about 8,600 BTUs per pound. And for those of you who wanna know, I believe a BTU is the amount of energy required to raise one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. If that means anything to you, great. But we're just gonna use this as an understanding of the amount of energy in the wood. And where does that energy come from? It comes from photosynthesis. So you see a tree, it's growing, it's absorbing energy from sunlight, it's storing that energy in the wood, and that's what we're burning to produce great barbecue. That's only important because it's kind of the opposite of a process that is extremely important when you understand how wood burns. And that process is called pyrolysis, pyrolysis. So pyrolysis is from two Greek words. One is pure, which is fire, and luo, which means to, to loose or to split or to break apart. That's not really critical to understand, but what you have to understand is that fire breaks things apart, okay? Pyrolysis is this. When you put a log on your fire, it will start to produce smoke before it turns into flame. That is pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is splitting off parts of the wood and releasing those parts as gas. And you can get a sense of what this is like if you've ever used charcoal. If you've ever used lump charcoal, sometimes it looks like a log, but it's just solid charcoal. What they've done is they've heated that wood in the absence of oxygen so that it doesn't start a fire. And what happens to the wood is it releases all kinds of gases that would normally be burned in a fire, but since there's no fire present because there's no oxygen, it just leaves the carbon behind, which is the charcoal. So pyrolysis, two parts here, it's gonna release gases, right? So that can burn. And then the coal that's left can also burn. And that's two different things. So the charcoal itself burning, that solid component of the wood being caught on fire, is called primary combustion. Now the gases that get released, so what would be smoke before it turns into flame, that's called secondary combustion. And you have both of those going on in a wood burning fire, or at least you should. 
One other thing about pyrolysis is that it is going to release a lot of mass and make available a lot of energy. So if you've ever picked up you know, a piece of lump charcoal, you know it's a heck of a lot lighter than a piece of wood the same size. That's because it's lost a lot of the stuff given off as gases in the process of turning it into charcoal. And heating in the absence of oxygen can be used for a number of purposes. They do it to say coal, to make something called coke. It burns super hot, so charcoal burns nice and hot. But when pyrolysis happens and you release those gases, you lose about 85% of the mass in a chunk of wood. And those gases that are given off are about 60% of the energy. So wood has not only the energy from what would become charcoal, but it also has the energy of all the gases that would be given off. At this point, I just want to take a second to define some of these terms that I'm using to make sure I'm 100% clear on it. First, let's talk about complete combustion. Complete combustion would be this. You take a piece of wood, you burn it, and you only make carbon dioxide and water vapor. That's the same stuff that you make if you, you know, are burning propane in a propane grill. So it doesn't really provide any smoke flavor at all. Now, complete combustion isn't really possible if you're burning a wood fire in your smoker. You're never going to reach complete combustion. But generally speaking, our goal is to get as close as we can to complete combustion for reasons I'll discuss later. Next, primary combustion. I mentioned it earlier, but I just want to be absolutely clear. Primary combustion is when you burn the solid components of wood. Secondary combustion is when you burn the gases given off by when you heat wood up. So that pyrolysis that I mentioned, when you're giving off gases, secondary combustion is burning those gases, and that usually happens to wood at about five to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And then finally, incomplete combustion is when you produce products from burning things that are not just carbon dioxide and water. You produce small amounts of other compounds. And for barbecuers, this is great news because those are the compounds that actually give barbecue a smoke flavor. So smoke is the result of incomplete combustion. What that means is, Things that you didn't turn into carbon dioxide and water vapor are what you see as smoke and also what give smoke flavor. So if you burn a propane grill, you don't see smoke coming out of it unless you're burning grease or something else in the grill. These are the things that you need to understand when I talk about each of these terms because I don't want you to be confused or miss out on anything that I'm saying because I did a bad job of explaining the terms that I'm using. There are a couple keys here to burning a good fire where you get close to complete combustion but not totally complete combustion. Number one, and perhaps the one that most people mess up, is oxygen. You have to have enough oxygen getting to your fire so that you burn an efficient and quote unquote clean fire. And also you need a temperature that's gonna be at or above 1200 degrees Fahrenheit for the process of combustion to really work well and so you get the clean smoke. Now, here's the thing you need to understand. Clean smoke, dirty smoke. Those are terms that are thrown around a ton in barbecue, and let me explain to you what it means. Clean smoke would be burning a fire where you're using plenty of oxygen and you're burning a nice, efficient fire, and the important part is this here. The molecules that you produce are going to be a lot smaller, they're going to be very flavorful, and the smoke that you see coming out of your stack is going to be almost clear, or it's going to be very, very faint. What that tells you is that you're burning a hot fire, you're burning an efficient fire, you're burning a fire with plenty of oxygen so that those compounds are small and flavorful because not all smoke compounds are created equal. Some taste great, some taste not so great. So that is clean fire. Dirty fire would mean that you're choking off oxygen, uh, you're not burning the wood efficiently, you're producing big compounds and it will come out of the smokestack as gross, white, billowing, thick smoke. That's what we mean when we say clean and dirty smoke. So clean, lots of oxygen, small, tasty molecules. Dirty, cutting off oxygen, big, smoky, white, thick, bad tasting molecules. That's the distinction we make when we're talking about clean smoke versus dirty smoke. So in practical terms, what does that mean? That means that if you're burning a wood fire in an offset smoker, you wanna make sure that your fire gets plenty of oxygen. Don't crank down the vents, don't do a bunch of crazy stuff like that. What you want is to regulate the temperature by the amount of fuel you put in, not the amount of oxygen that you allow in. Because if you're choking it down by cutting off oxygen, by closing down vents, what you're gonna get is a lot of that dirty smoke. You might be maintaining temperature well, but you're gonna get a lot of dirty smoke and the flavor that you achieve in barbecue is gonna be far lesser than what you could achieve by managing the fire with smaller pieces of wood 
more frequently to maintain temperature that way. Now, why oxygen is so important when burning a fire is because it is a necessary part of burning the wood. Otherwise, it'll just smolder. Otherwise, you'll only produce charcoal and a bunch of gases. You won't actually create a fire. So this is what we would call stoichiometric combustion. So that means the exact ratios of how much stuff you need to burn. So one pound of dry wood could use 6.4 pounds of air and you would produce 1.83 pounds of carbon dioxide, just over half a pound of water, and then just a shade over five pounds of nitrogen gas. Why nitrogen gas? Well, because the air is primarily nitrogen gas and only a small portion of the air is usable oxygen. Now, this tells you kind of what's happening when you're burning a fire, but in reality, this doesn't happen because for this to actually be what's taking place uh, in terms of how much air actually goes into your firebox, if it were only 6.4 pounds of air for every piece of, or for every pound of wood you burn, you'd be burning a dirty fire. Here's why. This is assuming that every single molecule of oxygen that enters your firebox will go and react with the fuel in the firebox. That's simply not gonna happen. So how do we overcome that difficulty? More air. If we add in, say, twice the oxygen that we think is necessary, we have a better chance of reacting nearly all of the fuel properly to the maximum extent that we're able to. This is also not true because we don't produce 100% carbon dioxide and water vapor as products. So we get close, we get very close if you're running a nice, hot, oxygen-rich fire, but we never achieve this. And we wouldn't want to anyway because then you would get the same flavor as if you were cooking with propane. So this is an idealized version of what happens, but I think it's important to understand this so that you can understand how what actually happens is different than what you might look at in a textbook. At this point, I think you guys probably have a pretty good sense of what goes on when you burn wood in your smoker. Now to answer the second question, and I've already mentioned some of these things, what do you have to do to get the best quality smoke? First, you have to make sure that your fire is getting plenty of oxygen. And I think we've already you know, highlighted the importance of oxygen. The other thing that you're gonna want to make sure that you have control over is the amount of moisture in your wood. And I believe that the ideal moisture content for your wood would be about 20% moisture. You should be fine if you're using something that's 15, 16, 17% moisture, up to 25% moisture or something like that. But I think about 20% is ideal. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about why in a second. It's important to know that wood dries from the outside in. So there are two things that you can do while splitting and cutting your wood to speed the drying process. Number one is you can split it into small pieces because the outside, right, is going to start releasing moisture. And since the moisture has a shorter distance to go to reach the outside to evaporate away, it's going to dry more quickly. Also, if you cut it short, the water will go to the ends of the, of the split and dry more quickly as well because water wants to go through the grain of the wood. That's the vasculature, it's the water carrying tissue. And so if you cut it short, it has a quick and easy path to get out to the outside world, I guess, and evaporate away and giving you a nice dry and barbecue ready piece of wood. Also, you have to understand that time is gonna be necessary for the wood to reach equilibrium. So what that means is eventually the wood will reach a level of dryness to where it matches its environment. So it's not gonna continually lose water until it's 0% moisture. And it's not going to stop at, you know, 100% moisture or something like that. But it'll eventually reach a point of stability where it can sit for a long time and still be perfectly good for barbecue. Now we come to the issue of what the problem is with too much moisture in your wood and too little moisture in your wood. And First, let's talk about if the wood is too green or too wet or has too much moisture. That's gonna cause problems for this reason. You put a fairly green log on the fire, it's going to absorb a ton of energy just trying to get rid of that water before it actually takes a light and starts burning. So number one, it's going to use a lot of energy before it really gets going. Number two is that water is gonna cause the fire to be cooler and you're going to produce bigger, less flavorful molecules that end up going through your smoker. So you're going to have to use more wood and you're gonna have a dirtier smoke if the moisture content is too high. The other thing, and probably people haven't thought about this very much, is 
if the moisture content is too low, it also causes problems. Now, just to give you an anecdote here, I once was running a thousand gallon pit and I had a couple pallets of kiln dried wood and I used a ton of that stuff. And for some reason, I just kept feeding the fire and feeding the fire and it seemed as if it just would go in and disintegrate and I had to add another log, you know, every four or five minutes. And I thought, this is crazy. What in the world is going on? Also, at the end of that cook, I tried some of the barbecue that I'd made and it was almost flavorless for an offset smoker. If it came from a less flavorful kind of cooker, then I would have probably not thought anything of it. But for this, it almost had no flavor and I couldn't figure out why. And eventually, after looking into it for a while, I figured it out. What happens when the wood is too dry and that wood was kiln dried, so it was, I don't know, five, six, seven percent moisture. What happens in that case is you put the wood on the fire and then pyrolysis that we talked about earlier takes place. So it starts releasing all the gases, but here's the problem. It releases those gases so quickly that there's not enough oxygen to burn those gases and you send a bunch of unburned smoke through the smoker because it's breaking down so fast. If you have about 20% moisture, the gases that are being put off by that piece of wood are going to be at an appropriate rate for the amount of oxygen that comes in. So you're going to be burning an efficient fire. You're not sending unburned fuel through the smoker. And for some reason, that unburned fuel didn't have a lot of smoke flavor. I haven't figured that part out 100%. I just know that burning wood that's too green doesn't work out well. And burning wood that has been kiln dried doesn't work out well either. Now, besides cutting and splitting wood into small pieces in order to dry quickly, what are some other things that you can do to make sure your wood gets seasoned quickly and is in perfect shape to go in your smoker? Number one, I would say, is put it in a sunny area. Because every increase of 20 degrees in Fahrenheit that the wood is sitting at will double the drying speed. So wood will dry twice as fast if it's you know in an environment that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit versus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing you should do is stack it loosely so that you don't have a bunch of surface covered for water not to be able to evaporate from. Also, I would say put it in a windy area because the wind whipping through there is gonna carry away moisture, giving you a drier piece of wood more quickly. And then finally, if you're in a place that gets a lot of rain, I would put a tarp just over the top layer of wood. Uh, but if you're not getting a ton of rain, I wouldn't really worry about it because in my experience, the moisture that gets on the surface of the wood evaporates really quickly and doesn't really penetrate deep in the wood. It just slows the drying process down. So if there's a lot of rain, just put a tarp over the top um, and just prevent the whole thing from getting soaked in water. But again, it's not the end of the world if it gets rained on. Now, the final thing you can do to get yourself in the best situation to burn a perfect fire in terms of your wood selection is get a wood moisture meter. Um, I'll put a link for this one in the description below, but it's pretty simple and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out how to use it, but maybe to open it. I don't know. So meters like this measure the electrical resistance in the wood. Basically what that means for us is the dry wood doesn't conduct electricity well, water does. So the amount of electricity that flows between this probe and this probe will tell it exactly, or at least very close to how much water is present. Also, you're gonna place the meter parallel to the grain. So we wouldn't wanna go like this and have one probe here and one probe here. We want it to be like this. And so we plug it in here, jump it in, and we have 18.7% moisture. And so to me, this is a great piece of wood to burn in the smoker. Other things you can look for, if you've handled wood for long enough, you can pick it up and feel it and know, oh, this is pretty well seasoned. It's not super heavy. Another thing you can look for is if the bark is loose. So if you can just pull off chunks of bark without too much effort, then it's probably pretty well seasoned. So this is a well seasoned piece of wood. Finally, you can, if you want to kind of bang it on some concrete or something and see if the wood kind of rings, because as it dries out, it makes more of a ringing sound instead of more of a thud sound. Um, of course, that's not very precise. I think it's probably in most everybody's best interest to just go get a wood moisture meter. You plug it in there, you see what the moisture is, and you don't have to do a lot of guessing. And one other note though is typically speaking, until the wood reaches equilibrium, that is, it's gonna be the same amount of moisture throughout the piece of wood and it's gonna be kind of equal to that of its average environment. 
Until that point, the wood on the outside is gonna have less moisture than the wood on the inside. So you might get a reading on the outside of say, 24% moisture, but on the inside, it could be as high as say 30%. So keep that in mind when you're choosing wood to burn in your smoker. And if you take time to select good wood, your barbecue will only benefit. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, comment down below, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, but make sure that you hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever we put out new videos. Also, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'll see you guys next time.